We are here today to talk about designing customer journeys at scale with Sumo Logic and Tatango. My name is Jamie Bertese. I am the president and COO of Tatango, and I'm here with Dion Hedgepath, the chief customer officer of Sumo Logic. So today's customer success pace setters are sprinting ahead. Basically, these folks who are really optimizing for customer success are able to deliver really low churn rates, superior NRR, and faster growth than other companies that have yet to master the art of customer success. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And we here at Tatango believe that a customer, the, to achieve this kind of uh, meteoric growth, one needs to operate with customer success as an operating model and really move away from kind of a silo driven model that we see here on the left, but move towards an operating model where the customer is delivered an optimal journey by all of the, these functions working together. And that's one of the things that we're gonna talk about here today. We really believe that the customer journey is a product and that you can win with inspiring customer journeys that you're able to build as you move forward with customer success as your operating model. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And the beauty of this kind of an approach working with companies like Tatango is it allows you to deliver day one value to your customers so that they are able to see outcomes very, very quickly. And, you know, as the industry's only composable customer success platform, this, this kind of modular approach is what's built into everything that we do. So I'm here today with Dion Hedgepeth from uh, Sumo, and I'm going to let Dion go ahead and introduce herself. If you can go to the next slide, and Dion, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. Super excited to talk with you today. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, thanks for putting that cool picture up. That was quite a day for us. A couple of weeks ago, oh, we were in New yeah. York. Yeah, and we're able to celebrate the two years as a public company because we um, were obviously in a pandemic <laughs> when we went public and we basically did this in the parking lot of Sumo two years ago. So it was kind of an uplifting moment. But but thank you so much. And what was cool is there's actually customers on stage with us as well. We had our cab that day and just really exciting. We couldn't obviously be here without our awesome customers. Um, maybe I'll tell a little bit about Sumo and then we can kind of have the, the discussion everyone's waiting for. So um, really quick, um, what Sumo does is we have a cloud SaaS um, a class, a SaaS platform and we basically take all the telemetry from the applications of our customers, right? And we have this amazing correlation capabilities so that SREs, developers, security analysts can basically detect and fix performance and security incidents um, very fast. So essentially we help ensure that applications are reliable and secure. Um, and I run the customer success organization, which is kind of all the post-sales functions, right? Support and services, um, premium support, um, education, but also CSMs and renewals. Um, let's see, anything. Uh, maybe just uh, one more note, uh, Jamie, um, which makes my job particularly fun at Sumo, um, is that we have customers that actually use a credit card and, you know, kind of the thousand dollars a month customer. And then I've got customers who pay eight figures, right. And are really right. Big fortune 100 customers. And so if you think about having to run a customer success motion, we really have um, several within our company and it's just a really, really fun job um, to be able to build that practice here. Awesome. So I bet everybody in the audience can really identify with you, uh, Dion, from the perspective of, you know, that range that you described of the cust your customer base, you know, from somebody who's paying you $1,000 a month using your credit card to probably yeah. like a very high touch model for those eight figure customers that you described. Yeah, I am. I am sure I'm not alone in this. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Okay. So here we are today in the third year of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, right? And 2022 has thrown us even more uh, curveballs with the economic, economic outlook, you know, fairly uncertain, high inflation, interest rates rising, you know, recession looming. 
it's a challenging time. And, the, and during this challenging time, there's even more pressure, I think, to deliver predictable growth, right? And those net revenue retention numbers that we were talking about. And so I think all eyes and, you know, most uh, great companies have really turned to customer success. And I think the way you describe it is just so perfect from the perspective of your organization. You know, customer success is this organization. It's this function that is kind of everything post-sales working together in a really streamlined fashion. It's not just the group of CSMs, as an example. Right. right. And so, you know, we're all really striving to reduce churn deliver a high NRR and make sure that, um, and that we're driving, driving growth through expansion for those customers. So as we, um, uh, you know, look to this, I would just say that the pressure is on from a customer success point of view, and we can just go ahead to the next slide, please. Thank you. And so one of the things I wanted to just start with in terms of, you know, our, our chat here today was just talking about this concept. You know, I think I mentioned it in a little bit of the preview, but at Tatango, we believe your customer journey is a product. It is the customer success operating model or the customer success organization's product. It's what they deliver to the customer on an ongoing basis. So what does that mean to you when you hear that, you know, your customer journey is the product? Yeah. Well, I mean, I just, Jamie, you know, I relate to this so much. Um, it is the first thing, in my opinion, that a CS leader should do when they join a new company is make sure that there's a established customer experience map. We call it a, a CEM here, but same thing, customer journey. Um, if there is one, know it, learn it, love it, right? Tweak it. Um, if there isn't one, you need one because obviously if you think about what a journey map is, it is laying out what you think the customer experience should be and all the activities that need to go in and which roles you need, which skills you need, and, you know, a lot of, you know, times I've run into this where someone will ask me, hey, Dion, can you advise us? Just spend an hour with us. We have these roles. Can you help us figure out what they should be doing? And what I always say is actually don't start with the roles. Start with the, the journey, right? And when you lay out the journey, you will see what roles you need. And maybe there's an ability to consolidate roles. Maybe you need more roles. Maybe you need SME roles. Maybe you need, right? And the, the journey map is like, for me, source of truth on how to deliver great customer outcomes. And it's just so challenging. I mean, how do you think about actually mapping the journey? I just imagine a, a CCO coming into a large, complex organization and, you know, really trying to dig into it, as I know you have at, at Sumo, but, you know, what did you do first? Yeah, well, actually, um, I, I'm, I, I've seen this enough that I could run it myself, but I do tend to bring in a journey map consultant because I think it's kind of good to have a facilitator. So that's one thing. But again, you could totally do it on your own. Um, there's a methodology around it, mm -hmm. but it's very key that you bring a lot of the different stakeholders across marketing, products, sales, it's definitely not a CS thing. It may be CS led, but you need all your cross-functional partners because as we talked about, it's the customer experience map. It's not the CS journey. It's all about how do you lay out the experience from a customer point of view. Um, and even like we've seen, you know, if the product leaders are in this, they get excited about how they can innovate the product to drive velocity in the map. Right. And so it's super important that it's cross-functional. Right. I totally agree with that. And that's something that we spend quite a bit of a, quite a bit of time here at Tango as well, you know, just yeah. from the perspective of making sure that everybody understands what they're supposed to be doing, what the role is, and how are we going to continue to um, iterate and improve so that we can, uh, you know, do more and more and more and better and better and better. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Let's go to the next thing. All right, so you know it's all about day one value and um, yeah. in success. You know we're we're very very oriented around delivering value to our customers, um, and we like to talk about this concept of seeing value immediately, right? And uh, of course, we've probably all heard about the famous Jeff Bezos memo 
uh, about day one and really operating as if it is day one, you know, whether even at, at a much later date, right? And, and he's built an entire company really oriented around this, uh, I would say this value, this, this, uh, this concept. So how does Sumo deliver day one value? Yeah, I mean, gosh, there's so much we could talk about. And and by the way, this is an evolution, obviously, for us. Mm -hmm. I always feel like we're not driving enough value, not fast enough. We always have, you know, uh, three new initiatives that we want to launch to drive more value. But let me maybe one thing, like a concept that I really believe in um, is just shifting left. So shift value left wherever possible. And I think you know, if you're a prospect, right? How do you shift a lot of the customer success assets, not as a post sales motion, but how do you shift that left in the sales cycle, right? So a couple examples, right? Um, and, and this is not the same, right, for every company out there, but at Sumo, um, customers who do proof of values or proof of concepts with us, they, when they become a customer, they're up and running already, right? So our POV motion is very similar to an implementation, they're up and running. And so that's one thing. And, and our customer journey map needs to meet them where they are, right? So you can't just lay out the same onboarding steps for a customer that's already been onboarding. You have to be able to have branches and shift your journey map accordingly based on what the customer, their maturity is, et cetera, right? Um, so that's one thing, just that's a great concept. But the second thing that that means is try to shift all of your templates to the pre-sales cycle too, right? Like there's no reason you shouldn't show your journey map to prospects. It's inspiring to them. Like, oh, you actually have a plan for me. You're not just going to sell and then I'm not going to talk to you again, right? Mm -hmm. So show the customer success plan in the sales cycle, if it makes sense as well. Even just the colors of the templates and the presentation format, if you can make it look the same, it will land on the customer, not like we have two different organizations, pre-sales org, post-sales org. It, the whole handoff process needs to look seamless, right? And so when I think about, man, day one value, and it's always, you, you wanna get better, just think shift left and it'll drive a lot of good activity that will make an experience for your customers better. That's right. All right. And the thing I think, you know, I think about here too is just that speed to value, right? From the perspective of, uh, you know, we've all started projects and had them take, you know, say six months, nine months to get something kind of up and running. But the other side of it, I think, is, you know, in the world that we're living in today, which is so digital, everyone is really expecting return on, you know, an initiative, yes. whether it's just an, even an internal initiative or it's some external spend or whatever it is very quickly. And so that's, I think, the other piece of it, which is like, how can we make that that return and that value for the customer just for so, sure. so fast and so early for them? Yeah. And I, you know, another thing to to do right in that light, right? If so, if you have a value office, which again, you know, we have a small value office, um, when they show ROI to a prospect, like you should be bringing that to the post sales so that you can prove this is what we talked to you about in the pre sales, this is the type of value you're going to get, right? Don't reinvent the wheel. Like you should be using those, we call them business value assessments in yeah. the sales cycle, right? All of those assets, even if you want to do an exec QBR for your strategic customers, right? You should lay that out in the plan in the sales cycle so that they have expectations to make sure that you're in front of them and in, that they're happy with the value that they're getting, right? Great. Okay. Let's go on to the next topic. All right. So I've heard people say recently at several, uh, it's time to kill the cadence call. What do you make of that? <laughs> yeah. I, um, so I, first of all, there's, there's nothing wrong with cadence calls in my view, right? But I completely relate to the part of this, which is cadence calls don't make sense for everyone, right? 
Like you can't just think I have, you know, uh, with all my customers, they all want cadence calls and it makes sense for them to have cadence calls. So for me, I think of it as like kind of two cohorts, right? The, the cohort that makes sense to have cadence calls is when they have a roadmap in place. There's ongoing work that you've agreed with them value on the value realization plan and they need a cadence call to keep that going and, and get help from you, right? So strategic accounts tend to be you know, more demanding, whatever the segmentation is that makes sense. I think absolutely cadence calls. And of course, trying to get in front of the execs you know, every, you know, is, is a good thing, right? But in the day-to-day -day with the project teams, it makes sense cadence calls for that cohort. A lot of customers don't need cadence calls. And in fact, I will tell you from my vantage point, I have a lot of vendors I use, right? Sure. And I can't do cadence calls with, with all of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for me, it's like shifting into a mode where, you can send customers really valuable and relevant information mm -hmm. and let them see it. And then they'll ask for a call with the topics that they want to discuss. So I think that is the motion that CS should shift to, that you have these two, cohort, these two cohorts. We're doing some pretty fun things that I'm really excited about in this second cohort. Um, we, we've been on the tech touch evolution for a while, right? Um, and now we're just con trying to mature it. So uh, one of the things we're um, rolling out is the auto QBR deck. We're not the only one doing this. A lot of people doing this. We're finally ready to. And I'm just so like things like that where I know if a vendor sent me a seven minute audio of a deck of a QBR. Dion, here's how things are going with our teams. Here's the value that would, you're, you're getting so far in our purview. Here are some of the issues we see that we'd like to help you with. I would be, I, I just feel like that's really respectful of people's time and it's way more efficient. And it's very likely that after they see the QBR deck, they'll want to actually engage, but not on a monthly cadence, just on the topics that are relevant to them, right? I totally agree. I think that it's um, one of these things that's just really making everything so, so much more streamlined and giving people back kind of time in their day, right? I mean, I, I agree completely about the fact that no one wants to get on the phone and talk to somebody just to hear themselves talk. Yeah. There's going to be a reason to discuss things, right? What, what is it that we're here to discuss? What problem are we really trying to debate and solve? And I think um, the the uh, QBR functionality, the auto QBR functionality is is definitely going to transform things. It'll be interesting to see that how that all uh, comes about. But certainly a seven minute video is way better than a half an hour, an hour long meeting, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll be, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how people put those together and how they are, uh, you know, uh, how streamlined and uh, almost interactive, I wonder, they'll really become. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. So on to the next. So we really all want to talk about continually iterating, right? Continually improving, continually in evolving the journey um, and the business processes and the delivery for the customers. Um, the, the uh, you know, auto QBRs, video QBRs, all this stuff that's coming is um, I think in a good, good example of that, right? That's a that's yeah. an ongoing iteration. You talked about it with Tech Touch, Tech Touch from the perspective of you're really trying. You've got something in place now, and what you're trying to do is really mature it so you can use it for more and more of your customers. So, you know, how do you keep up with the changing expectations of your customer base? You know, and changes in the business overall. And I guess the real question is, how do you stay nimble and get that access to the data so you know what to change or you know what to improve? Because, yeah. you know, there's just so much information. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, look, if you're doing, let's say you do a, an acquisition of an entire new BU, right, um, which actually we've done, um, we actually created a new journey map or overhauled it for that segment of customers with a new product line. So first of all, you could do major overhauls of your journey map. Um, and even the, if you're not doing a major like 
a change in your product line, it's probably good to really step back and look at the experience every 12 to 18 months and see if you really want to make major changes to that motion based on your learnings, right? Um, but for us, we tweak our journey map like monthly. Like I, it's, um, we actually, you guys don't use this term, but internally we use the term branches mm -hmm. um, because in Tatango, like, like every process change, we can create a new branch. So for example, we have, we do have a new like product. It wasn't through acquisition. It's a new product area. We actually created a new branch in our journey map into Tango, right? They have a different welcome letter because it's a different product, right? right. It has yeah. to have different links to the different education pieces. It has, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have, we have slightly different onboarding stages for that product line because um, the professional services is a little bit different. And then where we have to go, we have a little heavier pro project management for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and even things like we started scoring EB sentiment, right? Um, because EB sentiment is a big part of just, you know, our, our EBs, detractors, promoters, or do we not have a relationship there? So yeah. adding triggers in different points um, to, you know, uh, get the CSMs to go and, and score that. So there's a lot of little tweaks. Every time you're trying to make improvements, we just tweak the Tatango journey map constantly um, with new process branches, triggers, um, the tech touch thing we just talked about. Every time we have a new idea that we want to, hey, they're adding new data to the system. Let's send them an email with the new out-of-the-box app that goes with that data source, right? All these are tweaks that we're constantly doing um, to our journey map. And that's how we evolve. Right. I think it's awesome. I guess the constant is change, isn't it? Right. Yes. It's, you can never really stop. So you always have to understand, I think the picture of what's going on being able and be able to really kind of absorb what changes you should make, make those decisions, make the changes quickly, learn from those changes, ideally small changes, right. As we all know, sometimes the big ones tend to be difficult. Uh, so the incremental is, I think, way better and faster for the team to see results. Yeah. So. The, the other thing, Jamie, I would add here is um, as you evolve your journey map, mm -hmm. and we have new leaders all the time, right? New sales leaders, even new sales people, like they're like, what's her, what happens when I sell a new logo? What's the experience a customer gets? Um, we use the, you guys have this canvas right. um, feature. I use it all the time, which basically visualizes the journey map, but in the product. So as we add campaigns, you see them in the phases, right? You see the, the onboarding, the kickoff call, the templates, and it's a really great visual to explain our journey because a lot of work goes into this thing to, to, to instrument the experience for customers and to be able to show it in product, it makes it way more real than you creating PowerPoint diagrams on what the journey is. The, this is actual campaigns that fire trigger to customers. Um, so super powerful to share the journey map all the time. I would yeah. say to new yeah. people. I totally agree. You know, I think that, um, the old way is you know, doing things where people are designing something in a PowerPoint or a Google Slides or whatever, and then handing it over to someone to build for you, right? Yep. And the yep. problem with that approach is that as soon as you, you know, take a picture of that whiteboard and say, here, go build this out in PowerPoint and hand it over <laughs> to somebody, right, to, to actually uh, yeah. build, as soon as you do that, something changes and it's immediately uh, you know, out, of, um, out of sync or not entirely accurate. Yes. So I think that the kind of that maintenance piece is what led um, the innovation around Canvas from the perspective of people saying, hey, I can't continue to update these documents. And so the concept of kind of, you know, the Canvas just appearing for you and always being accurate so you can design build, run, and report and measure, you know, kind of all in one system where you don't actually have to do that maintenance, that constantly or right. something, I think has been a huge um, time saver for folks. Um, and uh, that we get tons of feedback from people that they really love that, the concept of it, you know, being like as if they're standing at the whiteboard, you know, yourself, the CCO of Sumologic and your top lieutenants and really iterating against the, 
against the journey, what you guys want to do to improve things. So it's awesome. Yeah. All right. and in fact, I would just add to that, Jamie, that because of that maintenance, believe me, they're not updating their PowerPoint journey maps. It's just stale all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So I think I think the world will never kind of never go back to that world now that we yeah. have you know things like Canvas that are just readily available, always always app, um, always uh, accurate and right there for you, really easy to just manipulate right um, in yeah. the visual itself. So I think it's great, exactly. really changing the world for us. All right. So next, signals. signals. All right. So we talk about signals here and it being kind of the key thing for scale up growth, right? And we really got to get, you know, understanding these signals and taking action on the, these signals. And as you've talked about, you know, you really are leaning into tech touch. We also here at Tango are doing the same thing. I think any very successful company that has lots and lots of customers who are coming on, you realize you have no choice because even if you had all the headcount in the world and you had all the uh, and you had, you know, um, the ability to fund all that headcount, you would still have this issue, which is finding those people and then yeah. training those people and then yeah. retaining those people. So if yeah. you have a successful business, the customers don't stop there. Keep coming. They keep coming. They're coming. And you've got to have a way to scale that up. So tell us, what are you guys doing with Tech Touch, and how do you think about this signals? Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, gosh, uh, my own thinking has matured so much. God, if you'd asked me this question three years ago to now, I mean, I used to think of Tech Touch as okay, it's just for my small customers, right? Because I don't have people and blah blah blah, right? But that is, that's just not Tech Touch. Actually, it's like it's 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 of course for the that segment, right? I've got like you know, over a thousand customers, right, in this smaller segment that we fully use Tech Touch for. Mm -hmm. um, but Tech Touch is for everyone, actually. I even the high, highest touch customer, you should use Tech Touch as a combination of in person, right? And Tech Touch. It's just a wonderful thing. So that's one of the learnings is that like we started it, right, with our what we call our auto segment. But quickly, the CSM-led segments were like, what? Oh, my gosh. Like, we want those triggers to our customers, too, right? So if you think about a CSM, they always have too many accounts, no matter what. Like, yeah. there's never enough time, right? So if they could segment their base, their, right, their portfolio with tech touch so that they're responding to valuable information with cust to customers when the customers need it. And again, not on the monthly cadence, that is so much better time spent on both sides, right? So, you know, a couple other learnings I would share here. Um, we, when we first started Tech Touch, we simply just had a campaign person, like a, someone who wrote beautiful letters and campaigns. <laughs> and that of course is really important. Um, now our next evolution is really hiring operations data analysts, right? Because it's not about just the campaign itself. It's what campaigns to tweak and add on a weekly basis, yeah. right? And that's what matters. So how do you use data to continuously be smarter and sending that valuable just-in-time information to customers. So that's one thing is yeah. data, bring data people, right? Um, the second thing learning is customers still want experts. Just because you're not putting an expert with them on a cadence or as a named expert, you mm -hmm. still have to bring expertise. So when a customer gets tech touched and wants to talk to you, send them to an expert. Right versus don't send them to community or the Slack channel. Right, mm -hmm. I think if you really want to drive great customer experience, send them to a pooled model. Right, that's why people have pooled models because that's right. Yeah, experts. Right, and that was just some changes in thinking that I've kind of had over the years. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to ask you about the pooled model and kind of a, were you guys using dynamic assignment? Because I think this is the way to be more efficient, right? For folks, yeah. so for the, for the folks in the audience, basically, you know, one way of doing tech touch is to say, let's say you have a thousand customers and you have, you know, uh, I don't know, four people on your team, you're going to 250 customers to this person, 250 to that person, you know, there's a name associated with those customers. But if you use dynamic assignment and a kind of a pooled model, what you're doing is when somebody needs help, they need that expert, you're, you're bringing them to the person who's available or who is, who is the combination of available and best skill set. Maybe there's yeah. a language question or, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, how you do it. So that's the, that's the more, um, the more mature way that uh, folks are doing it where they're really driving, I think the, the more compelling results. Um, and so is that what you guys are doing over at we are We are in that evolution now. Yes. On the, the assignments and how, how are we going to watch the queue better and just improvements there, right? Because you also need to it's interesting because it starts to mirror a lot of the things you do, right? From a event support standpoint yeah. is how do you quickly get someone, the right person, the right skill in a, a quick amount of time, right? You just, it's a lot of the same principles there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. How about admin? I must ask you about that because, you know, you guys have, uh, as you mentioned that you're, you know, you're bringing, I moved away from just having like a person to write campaigns to now the company yeah, yeah. of like a data person, maybe an operations person, you know, how are you, how do you think about that aspect of it? Yeah. Um, so I mean, for to tango, um specifically, we don't have an admin. I mean, I, one of the things I love about this product is our practice um, leader who's responsible for all global best practices, content, consistency of the motion, right, for the CS team. Um, he just, you know, if we were like, oh, we want to we want to add a new branch and do something, he just does it himself. It's like mm -hmm. so, I guess, easy to UI point and click. I'm not, like, we just don't have any overhead with that. Mm -hmm. So the people who actually have the subject matter expertise in CS, they just they can make the changes, right? Yeah, so it's highly efficient for you then. Highly efficient. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So then um, let's talk about uh, customers. So when we can move to the next slide here, you know, in the current environment, we're all, as we talked about already, we're all really being asked to do more with less, right? You know, it's, it's challenging with the recession and inflation, all these things that we've talked about. So, you know, what does that mean when you think about having the right resource to execute the plan you know, you see the quote here, grow your customer account, not your team size. Yeah. How, what are you guys doing as you think about this? Yeah. Well, let me start. I would say, Jamie, in, whether we were in an economic downturn, whether or not we were just getting out of a pandemic, like any company size you're in, this is going to happen. You're just never going to have enough CS people as you grow ever. Like I, so you have to know, like, no matter what, you should build out tech touch no matter what. I, I think it's given what we just talked about, tech touch is not just for small customers. It's not for just low touch. It's for it, because you will find as you mature your and have more knowledge of your base and the characteristics of your customers, mm -hmm. you can start segmenting them not by size, but by the, whether or not there's more value in doing a tech touch model with them versus a named CSM model. Right. So you're just gonna get there no matter what. Mm -hmm. And you're always gonna have to do more that more, you know, with less. And that's the expectation I think you should have as a leader in CS. So I kind of think of this as start building tech touch tech touch. Just start, right? It's smart. <laughs> it makes sense no matter what your segmentation is. And even start tech touch if you don't have great data in the beginning, just start with time-based sequences, right? Yeah. So, you know, first week, 30 day, 60 day, 90 day, just start with time-based sequences, get the motion down, right? Then mature to trigger-based sequences, right? As you start to understand your customers, what's data is important, um, what data triggers things that you'd wanna do and mature a trigger-based motion. Right. Um, but for me, those are kind of like step one, two, three 
as you so that you are ready for the moment when it's like, okay, we're going to sell another 500 logos next year. And you're like, I need a hundred people. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, then you're, you're just, you have a lot more flexibility to do smart things and it's the right thing for the company. At the yeah. End. And I think you're leaning into your success, right? You're preparing and doing it and making, making it happen so you can scale up when you need to. Totally. Um, you've got that, you know, as you, even as you mentioned, yeah. you know, you're in the process right now of maturing this aspect of your business and of your customer success operating model. You're not in the, pro you're not at this point in your stage, you know, laying the foundation, you've done the laying of the foundation and all the other pieces already, um, which is great to see.